So the next question, we have, or we have looked at how you would know that your cells are infected, but sometimes cells don't display any cytopathic effect. So you have to determine whether there are viruses present in your cells or not. So how do you determine how many viruses there are in a sample? And there are two general ways that we're going to be talking about. One way is to measure viral infectivity. The other is to measure physical particles or components of particles. All right, so let's start with infectivity. <coughs> the plaque assay is, in my view, the most important way of measuring viral infectivity. And this slide shows a photograph of a plate showing individual plaques. It was first developed in the 1930s by virologists who were studying bacteriophages, that is viruses that infect bacteria. In this photograph, what you're looking at is an agar plate. There's a lawn of bacteria that has grown on the surface of the agar. And wherever a bacterium has been infected by a virus, uh, those bacteria have made additional viruses which eventually spread and form a zone of killing on the monolayer. So each clear area is a plaque which simply represents virus killing of the bacteria. And this is a lytic bacteriophage, which is why it can kill the cells. So you can count each of these plaques and then determine the titer of the virus in terms of plaque forming units per milliliter, for example. And <clears throat> each plaque then, the assumption is, arises from an individual virus. And we'll talk about the logic behind that in a moment. This assay was then modified so it could be used for animal viruses. That was done in 1952 by Renato Dubeco, as shown here. And he received the Nobel Prize for this uh, in 1975 for this and other discoveries. On the upper left is his first plaque assay with poliovirus, and this has become a much more improved assay. This is very faint now. It's not a good photo, uh, but he, his paper is shown here, Production of Plaques in Monolayer Tissue Cultures by Single Particles of an Animal Virus. So that's an important part of the title, by single particles of an animal virus. Uh, we'll talk about that in a moment. So this now allowed titration of animal viruses. This is 1952, not long after John Enders and colleagues had shown that you could grow poliovirus in cultured cells. So you can see Dulbeco jumped right on that discovery and said, look, we can do plaque assays, we can quantify viruses, and we can do genetics. And we're going to talk about that in the next lecture. To do a plaque assay, you have a, a tube of material that you think contains a virus. This can be a, a supernatant from infected cells, a clinical specimen, and then you make serial dilutions in a buffer. Typically we make tenfold serial dilutions, and then we plate a small amount of each dilution onto a monolayer of cells. We simply add 0.1 ml to the monolayer, we take off the medium, we add 0.1 ml of our suspected virus-containing solution, we allow the virus to absorb, then we cover the cells with a semi-solid overlay typically an agar containing overlay with nutrients so that the cells can continue to survive. And then after a few days, we remove the agar overlay, we stain the cells, and then wherever viruses have infected cells and killed them, you see a clear zone or a plaque. And you can count each plaque and calculate the titer of the virus in PFU per mil. So here there are 17 plaques here. The calculation gives us 1.7 times 10 to the 8th PFU per mil, working back through all the dilutions. Now, you typically want a, number of, a plate with a good number of, pla of plaques on it that are countable, not too few because that's, uh, that's associated with too, uh, too much error. And if you have too many plaques, of course, you can't count them reliably. So you always plate a range of dilutions so that you hit one uh, with a good number on it. Here are some photographs of plaques to give you a better idea of how they look and how they develop. On the top is a depiction of what's going on when, you, when a plaque is growing. So we have a monolayer of cells. And say, in one part of the monolayer, one cell is infected by one of the viruses that we put on the cell. And that makes the cell infected. It's shown here as red. When that cell releases virus particles, those particles will then spread to neighboring cells and infect them 
and so on, and that focus of infection will get larger and larger. Now, because the cells are covered with an agar overlay, that means that the virus spread is restricted to neighboring cells. The if you had a liquid overlay on these cells, the viruses would float into the medium, infect all cells, and the whole monolayer would be killed. By having an agar overlay on top, you restrict the diffusion of the newly made viruses to a small area, and that's how you get a plaque. On the lower left is a microscopic photograph of a single plaque. And you can see the intact monolayer around the plaque. These are healthy cells. And then in the middle are the dead cells. They have rounded up and detached from the monolayer. And when you take off the auger overlay and stain these cells, this will become a hole in the monolayer. These rounded up cells will move away. On the right is a plaque formed by a virus that contains a gene encoding beta-galactosidase. So this agar overlay has been uh, saturated with a precursor for the enzyme XGAL that turns blue when the enzyme is present. So you can see the virus-infected cells are turning blue. The ones on the outside of the plaque are still alive. The ones on the inside are uh, rounding up. Now the next slide is actually a movie of the formation of a plaque. I waited for this movie for, for 30 years. It just came out a few years ago uh, by uh, Jeff Smith and his colleagues in the UK. And it really makes clear how a plaque is forming. So what they did was to set up a, a plate of infected cells and focused a camera on it. They found a single infected cell very early on in infection and then did, then did time-lapse photography taking a frame every so often and put a movie together to show how a plaque develops. So you can see the plaque starts developing in the middle and then the cell death moves outward in a wave, in a circular wave. It's almost as if you dropped a pebble into water and you're seeing the ripple go outward. So again, the infection begins at the beginning and this movement that you see outward is the change in refractoriness of the cells as they die and detach from the monolayer. So that is over about a 15-hour period, the formation of a plaque. So this is what's going on in the monolayer. And then, of course, if you remove the overlay and you stain it, you get a hole in the monolayer, which is what is the plaque. This is what uh, another a plaque assay looks like. Uh, these are cells infected with influenza virus. And you can see three different dilutions of virus. And the, these monolayers have been stained with a dye called crystal violet. So it stains the living cells purple. And then you can see holes in the monolayer where, where a virus has initiated an infection and gone through multiple cycles of replication and formed a plaque. Now an important question which was alluded to in the Dolbeco paper, how many viruses are needed to form a plaque? Dolbeco wanted to know the answer to that question very early on when he developed the plaque assay for animal viruses because it had important implications for doing genetics on viruses. If you only need one virus to form a plaque, you could make clonal stocks of viruses by taking the virus that, you, that uh, gave rise to a single plaque. The way you answer this question is quite simple. You do a dose-response curve. You make dilutions of virus, and you do plaque assays with each one, and then you plot the relative virus concentration versus the number of plaques. If one virus particle is enough to form a plaque, then the dose response curve will be linear, shown by the red line, because uh, it, this is one hit kinetics. One plaque, sorry, one virus is enough to form a plaque. So for one hit kinetics, the number of plaques is directly proportional to the first power of the concentration of the virus inoculated. So that's why you get a straight line. Most viruses follow one hit kinetics, i.e. one virus is enough to form a plaque. There are some viruses, though, that follow two hit kinetics. When you do this dose response curve, you get a curve such as the blue line here. And this is because for these viruses, you need two virus particles to form a plaque. And for two hit kinetics, the number of plaques is directly proportional to the square of the concentration of the virus inoculated. These viruses have two hit kinetics because you need two virus particles because the genome is, in fact, in two pieces. And you need both parts of the genome to get in a cell to initiate an infection. And there are some viruses that need uh, three particles to infect cells as well.
So that is showing us that for most viruses, one particle is enough to form a plaque. Now, another technique using the plaque assay is called plaque purification. It is a method for producing what we call clonal virus stocks. In other words, stocks of viruses derived from a single particle. I think you can see that in terms of genetics, it's good to start with such clonal virus stocks, although there are some limitations to this, as we'll see much later in this course. But when you start working with a virus, typically you want to plaque purify it, make a clonal virus stock to ensure that uh, everything that you work with is homogeneous. We usually do this multiple times. We take a plaque assay with nicely isolated plaques. Remember, there's an agar overlay on this. You take a pipette, you plunge it into the agar right over one of the plaques. You can, and this is, of course, before staining them. You can actually see most plaques through, through, uh, by just holding the plate up to the light. You put a pipette in here. You take a little plug of agar and you put it in buffer and the virus will come out of the agar. And then you repeat this two more times, this whole process, because there is some chance that a plaque might have been formed just accidentally by two virus particles. Even though one virus is enough to form a plaque, by chance sometimes two viruses will infect a cell. And you want to not, if you want to make a clonal virus stock, you, you have to not do that, so you do it a couple of times. Some viruses do not kill cells or they don't form plaques. Uh, so we have to have other ways of measuring their infectivity. And one way is illustrated here, the endpoint dilution assay. And what's done here is to infect uh, a number of cells with different dilutions of virus. You can see here we've made 10 to the minus 2 to 10 to the minus 7 dilutions of virus. We infect small wells of cells. Each of these wells in this 96 well plate has a monolayer of cells in it, and we put in each row uh, the separate dilutions in multiple multiple samples. So, for example, row A, all of the rows and well, or sorry, all the wells in row A contain the minus two dilution. All the rows in all the wells in row B contain the minus three dilution, and so forth. So you infect these cells with the dilutions of virus. You incubate the plate until replication has occurred. And then you examine each well and say, is the virus causing cytopathic effects? Whatever happens to be the CPE for your particular virus, rounding up of cells, syncytium formation, anything else. And you score for cytopathic effect. And that's what's shown on the table here. You can see that uh, a plus means that cytopathic effect was observed, that the low dilutions, all of the cells show, all of the wells show cytopathic effects. At minus four, then we have one that didn't. And at minus five, you have one, two, three, four, five wells uh, without cytopathic effects, and one, two, three, four, five wells with cytopathic effects. And then as you dilute further, most of the wells are negative. So what the end point of this assay is the dilution at which 50% of the wells are infected as judged by cytopathic effects, and that would be 10 to the minus 5. So we would say this virus stock contains 10 to the fifth tissue culture infectious doses 50% or TCID 50. And that way you can standardize your virus stocks and compare them among experiments. Now this is very convenient that I have put the 50% endpoint right at a dilution of minus 5. In reality, uh, it, it rarely ends up that the 50% point is on a, uh, an integer dilution. <clears throat> so you have to use math to calculate. The actual TCID 50 comes out to numbers like 10 to the 5.5 or 6.5. Another important concept having to do with virus infectivity is the particle to PFU ratio. And this is very simple. This is simply the number of virus particles in a sample divided by the number of infectious particles. So if I have a sample of 100 infectious particles and there are 100 virus particles in that sample, then the particle to PFU ratio is 1. It turns out that this P particle to PFU ratio is about 1 for many phages, but it's high for many animal viruses. And this makes it difficult 
to study uh, animal viruses. So let me explain that to you. Here's a chart showing particle to PFU ratios of some animal viruses. So for example, for adenoviruses, that ratio is between 20 and 100. That means, say, for every 100 particles, only one of them is infectious. So one out of 100 particles is infectious. So if, remember, a particle means a physical virus particle. And infectivity is measured, say, by a plaque assay. That's why we have particle to PFU ratio. For some animal viruses, the number is low. It's 1 to 2. So if for some leaky forest virus, almost every particle is infectious. But for papillomaviruses, only 1 in 10,000 particles are infectious. This is a complicating variable because if you are studying an infected cell, you often don't know if whatever it is you are measuring is a consequence of what the total particles are doing or just the infectious ones. So let's say you're taking pictures of viruses moving into cells. How do you know those are actually infectious particles and that is a actual productive pathway? So it makes things complicated. There are ways to work around this, but you have to be aware of this. Now, why is the particle to PFU ratio so variable? Why is it that for some viruses it's 1 and for other viruses it's 10,000? Well, remember, first of all, rem let's emphasize what this means. We know from this dose-response curve that we talked about not too long ago that a single virus particle can initiate infection, right? A single particle can initiate infection. The linear nature of the dose-response curve tells us that. But the high particle to PFU ratio of most animal viruses tells us that not every virus is successful. Even though a single particle could be infectious, not every one is, sometimes only one in 10,000. Why not? We don't really know, but we have some ideas, and three of them are listed here. First, some particles are damaged when they're made by the cell. Uh, we may make them in the laboratory in cells, but we may damage them in, the, in a variety of ways by all sorts of conditions. So that may make them not infectious. Uh, many genomes may have mutations in them that render them not infectious. It may be a byproduct of replication that you make a lot of genomes with non-infectious uh, mutations in them. And finally, uh, I think the complexity of the infectious cycle probably is a big factor. Remember in the beginning of this talk I showed you an infectious cycle with multiple steps. Now in order for a virus to reproduce it has to go through all of those steps in the right order and at the right time. And if you make a mistake or you fail at any particular step, you don't complete the cycle, so you may make an aberrant particle. So this may be another reason why the particle to PFU ratio is high for many animal viruses.